Today, we're really used to powerful computing. In fact, most of us have it in this pocket. A computer that has amazing processing power that they compared to 10 or 20 years ago. And that's the needs for computing is increasing over time. And part of the reason it's been increasing so much over the past 50 years or so or more is because of Moore's Law. The comp computation ability of electronics is just growing exponentially over time. But we need more computing power for machine learning, other, other kind of applications. And Moore's Law is kind of slowing down. Some people said it's retiring, okay? And we need more computing power. So what people like Google does in their gigantic data centers is besides using central processing unit CPUs, they also use devices called GPUs, graphic processing units. And even in fact for machine learning, they've invented this kind of silicon device called TPUs, tensor processing units, to give them more power to kind of push this as much as, as possible. What I want to talk to today is a potentially new technology based on what we can call QPUs, or quantum processing units, which for certain classes of problems might give you much, much more computing power than, than we have today if we can get this to work. Again, only for certain classes of problems. And I want to talk a little bit today about how the laws of nature actually allow us to do that. And then physicists has been thinking about this for 20, 30 years or so, and we're just getting to the point to be able to test these and build really interesting systems. And uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, what may be possible there. Now, to understand quantum computing and what's going on, I have to describe a little bit about how quantum mechanics works. <clears throat> quantum mechanics is absolutely fundamental to the world around us. It's very strange, but if there weren't for quantum mechanics, the atoms that make up of you wouldn't have any size at all. We wouldn't be here. The world would be totally different. So what happens here is you have a, a nucleus, let's say a hydrogen atom, which I get here, it was a proton, and you have an electron. They're oppositely charged, and they want to attract each other. These are essentially point particles, and if the world was just classical, which is our normal, everyday uh, experience, these two particles would, would come together and stick to each other, and atoms would have no size, okay? However, that's not what happens on these small scales. The laws of how these things stick together on the small scale is governed by quantum mechanics, where now no longer the electron can be thought of as a point particle, but as some kind of cloud around the hydrogen atom which are kind of given here schematically as these little red clouds that, that uh, now, a cloud is kind of a, a good idea, but you have to realize nature is a lot more clever than that. You kind of think of a cloud as it may be being random position or out there. That's not what happens in quantum mechanics. In there, it's, it's wave functions. It's everywhere at the same time, all around the atom and doing so in a very well-defined manner. And it's so well-defined that, in fact, you can use the laws of quantum mechanics to do well-defined operations, very predictable operations, and thus you're able to do computations on it. Okay, so quantum mechanics, people hear about the uncertainty principle. Things are actually very well-behaved and very certain, unknown, if you use it in the right way. Now what happens is, is you form a cloud, there's a natural kind of ground state orbit that the things naturally stick together, and that particular state we can actually encode in what we call a quantum bit state or qubit state. Okay, and this ground state with the analogy of classical information of bits being zero or one, we're going to call it a zero with this funny bracket notation that physicists use. The brackets kind of indicate that it's a funny quantum state. Now there are other states, if you like, other oscillation frequencies or tones of the atoms that the electron can be oscillating in. They're different orbits. 
And one can use one of these other states as encode that and say that's the one state, okay? And that lives not infinitely long, but let's say long enough so that you can do some interesting calculations with it. And then since these are the two different frequencies, what you can do is take the hydrogen atom, shine in some light to it, and that light will get absorbed by the atom and make transitions between 0 and 1, and then you'll be able to do some kind of logic with it and, ma and make uh, transitions between the 0 and 1 state. And then uh, this is the basis of how you would do your quantum computation. So it's similar to how classical logic works, but uh, it, it has these unusual states that allows you to do the quantum logic. So with that in mind, you might ask, well, how is this going to be useful for anything? And using the analogy we just started with, what's interesting about quantum mechanics, it can be in these two states, states of mind, if you like, of zero and one at the same time. And the physicists will write that as zero plus one. So it, it's both of these states at the same time uh, in this quantum mechanical system. And what this allows you to do, essentially, is to take this state and run it through some computation and get the answer for what happened if it was zero and what happened if it was for one in, in one operation. Whereas classically, if you want to know what's happening for zero or one, you would have to run it through twice, okay? So it's a parallel computer, okay? That's the, the essential idea of why quantum information is so interesting. Now, uh, of course, with one hydrogen atom and one qubit, zero or one, you get a factor of two parallelization, which is nice, but that's not going to be very earth-shattering at all. And what happens is the real power comes from when you have more atoms in the system. So let's just take two hydrogen atoms. They're both in the zero plus one state. This state actually represents all four combinations of 0 and 1. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And what you see here is by adding one qubit, you've now doubled the size of the states that you can compute at the same time. So if I add another qubit, 3, you're going to have 8 states. And 4, 16, and 5, 30, it will be 32 and 6, 64, et cetera. And you see that the parallel computation is growing exponentially as 2 to the number of qubits. So it's growing very fast, and it could be very powerful. And you know, at, at a modest number of qubits, it's a huge number of parallel computation. And in fact, uh, what's interesting is if you take 50 qubits, and we and others are building systems right now, that are that size, 2 to the 50, if you could use that superposition of 50 qubits, 2 to the 50 is a huge number, trillions of numbers. And the memory required to like, hold that is equivalent to what's in the world's biggest supercomputers. It's a huge amount of parallel processing. If you go to 300, which is something I think may be possible in the next few years once we figure out how to do a few more things. Two to the 300 is a number that's bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. And clearly, at that point, you're doing, you would be doing some kind of parallel computation that you could never do classically. Okay. So I'll call this, you know, we know about big data. I'll talk about this really big data, okay, exponentially big data. And the nature actually allows us to think about doing some computations in this way. Not all computations would be useful this way. You have to build the right algorithms. Now, I'm a hardware guy. I'm going to talk a little bit about qubit systems and what we're going to build. So we started with the hydrogen atom. And we have to have a lot of qubits. And of course, those qubits have to interact with each other to build some kind of logic gates like you do with classical computing. You need an and AND gate as well as the NOT gates. So NOT gates are single, single bit gates, AND gates are two qubit gates. So you want to build an atom circuit, and you would take, say, a molecule, okay, that's made of atoms. You can imagine things interacting together. There's kind of a problem with doing atoms in the fact that if you take a, a molecule like this 
and you want to shine light on it to, to do some kind of operations to change the zero into the one, well, the light, the wavelength of light, is about a thousand times bigger than the molecule. So that's so big that the light is not going to be able to choose that atom and not the atom next door to it. We have to have intricate control of all these different atoms. So this is one of the problems facing us, is that typical quantum systems, being very small, are very hard to engineer and to build a complex system uh, like you would want to do for a quantum computer. So that's kind of the problem. Now, there are various ways that physicists solve this. And some of those ways have won physicists the Nobel Prize. So you have to do this very cleverly. Um, what, the way we're doing it, what I'm going to show you, Data, is on a quantum circuit, where we actually make an electrical circuit where the current and voltages in that circuit are no longer classical quantities, which you normally design circuits around, but they're quantum properties. Just, and and they, ha they have uh, these wave functions associated with it. So in this particular uh, 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 circuit here, there's a ground plane of aluminum everywhere. And where it's dark, there's a cut in the aluminum. And the cross in the picture forms an uh, island where uh, there's a capacitance from the island to the ground. And then these little leads down here forms what's called a Josephson junction, which represents an inductor. So we have a quantum circuit that's basically a 6 gigahertz microwave oscillation. But it turns out there's some nonlinearity in the junctions so that you can get this quantum behavior uh, uh, as described with the hydrogen atom. And what's actually happening here is in this oscillator, you have current flowing into this island and out of this island. And the current is flowing both in and out at the same time in the same way that the electron is, say, at one side of the uh, nucleus and the other side at the same time. OK, it's the same kind of behavior. And it's really strange that quantum mechanics, which normally you think of as working for atoms, it can also work for electronic circuits too, if you design it right. And uh, you, know, you have to operate this at very cold temperatures uh, so that the thermal noise doesn't wash out all the quantum effects. But it is possible to build quite complex quantum circuits. And what's nice about build, building these circuits is they're big. So these are a few hundred microns across. This is easy to make with modern microfabrication technology the same technology that's used to make these complex computers, only it's kind of bigger. And then this is a big size so that you can bring in microwave light, if you like, through these little wires. And these wires are much smaller than the structure. So you can easily control this because it's a large size. So it's kind of strange. You know, Moore's law tells you you want to make everything bigger, where from quantum computing, making it large enough to make this thing technologically accessible uh, helps you out a lot to, to be able to build the systems. So you can build these simple systems, and then you can build more complex systems on top of that. Let me just explain a little bit about how this thing works and the strangeness of quantum mechanics. This is a single qubit operation, OK? And the way it's, I said, it's a microwave oscillator. So the way we do is to operate it is we just let the system relax to the ground state. It just releases its energy through small amount of dissipation. Then we put on a microwave a pulse that's resonant with this inductor capacitance resonant, resonance. And this will make transitions between the ground state and the one state and the one state back in the ground state. And I'll show how that works in a second. So you get transitions between the qubit state and then at some point, we have to measure where it's the ground state and the first state. And unfortunately, I can't explain how that works. But in quantum mechanics, when you do that, you'll get a 0 or 1. Okay? And, uh, 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 you ha and then what you have to do is repeat the experiment about 1,000 times or so to get a probability of the 0. Now, this is a plot of actual experimental data where we vary the time of this microwave pulse. And if the time goes to 0, this curve goes here to a probability to be in the 0 state of 1, which is how we set up the problem. 
But if we put in a pulse of the way we set this up of 40 nanoseconds, the probability is zero now goes to zero. And in fact, we find that this is in the one state. So a 40 nanosecond pulse of microwaves is a not gate. It changes zero to one. And classically, we know what that means, OK? And you can also see that if we are in the, the, the one state here, and we put on another 40 nanosecond pulse, this system then goes back to the zero state. The probability zero is one. And again, we know that from classical logic. A not and a not is the identity. It does nothing. Okay. But quantum, you can do this much more strange things. Instead of 40 nanoseconds, let's pulse it with 20 nanoseconds. And now the probability of zero is 50%. In fact, it's this 50% zero, 50% one state, which is the zero plus one state I told you about. Okay? And you're, I'm going to call this, and note that if you do a square root of naught, 20 nanoseconds, and another, square, another operation, 20 nanoseconds, you get a naught. So I'm going to call that a square root of naught operation. Square root of naught, square root of naught is a naught. 20 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds is 40 nanoseconds, which is a knot. Now, from your classical logic point of view, you have no idea what that means. OK, I understand that. But what quantum computing allows you to do is have this more, oops, more complex uh, uh, kind of operation, this square root of knot, that's not available classically. And this, this makes the 0, 1, plus 1 state, which then you can do all this parallel computation with. So it gives you a richer sense of operations. And physicists and computer science and algorithm developers then take advantage of that richer set to do more powerful computation. It's complicated. I won't go into that. But that's the essential idea. And this is just a, just a generalization of conventional logic to include the possibility of these quantum mechanics. And the whole logical structure of these operations are completely well defined, as they are classically. And you just have to get used to them to learn how to use them in a, in a real system. So this is a, now we throw some pictures of what we're building. This is a picture of a nine qubit device we've run earlier this year. Instead of a cross, this is an I, but it still forms a capacitor. We now couple these two qubits together with this kind of mutual inductance structure of two coils placed next to each other. And this could be made tunable uh, by this th thing. So we can adjust the amount of coupling between all the qubits. And here we have all the control wires for the qubits and the coupling on the bottom. Here's the qubits. And then this is a readout circuits where we put in a pulse of microwaves. And the phase shifts depends whether this is a 0 or 1 of that a microwave train. And then we read it out here. So we can, again, scale this up. Uh, you know, using get conventional fabrication. Once we know how to build one qubit, we just kind of copy and paste and we can build more complicated circuits. That's the beauty of uh, microfabrication. This is kind of a picture of a more most latest devices as we're learning to scale up. This is a 22 qubit device and we're actually fabricating a, a 50 qubit device uh, right now that should be ready at the end of uh, mid uh, end of December. Uh, what this is, is this is actually the qubit chip that we make at the UC Santa Barbara with Google, which uses some special fabrication magic to get everything to work right. And then we take this chip and we flip it over and connect it to this other carrier wafer via indium balls or indium bump bonds that do all the electrical connections. And then this brings all the electrical connections to the outside here. And then that is, these two chips are placed in this circuit board right here with a bunch of wire bonds. And then those, those uh, leads come out to here uh, to a microwave connector. And then by putting in the microwave pulses and other pulses here, we can control the chip. And this whole device is placed in what's called a dilution refrigerator, uh, which gets us to very cold temperatures of about a hundredth of a Kelvin. So that's about 10 to the minus 4, a little bit less than 10 to the minus 4 of room temperature. And you have to get it cold so that the thermal energy gets removed and won't wash out the quantum mechanics. 
okay? But you can do that. It's something you buy, and then you can just wire it up. So here's another mount, the older mount we had. Our chip is in here. We connect this with all these, these controls here. They go up the various filters to get rid of the thermal noise from room temperature, and then it goes up to our control electronics. So you can see in the next slide here, those wires went up, and then they came back down here, and then this just goes to a rack of control electronics where we have gigasample per second D to A converters and microwave generators to put in all the pulses to control this, okay? So there's a lot of control stuff that we have to do and, and a lot of software we have to write to get this to work. But, uh, you, know, that's, you know, that's what you want to do. And then if you're going to get this to work accurately, you can then take advantage of this very powerful computation going on here. So this is just a picture of the whole system. The chip is going inside here. This is the dilution refrigerator again. This is commercially bought. Here's the wires coming out to a rack of control electronics. And here's someone sitting here programming it and, and taking the data for it, programming all this. You can tell this is a stage photo because the lab is so tidy. It's normally <laughs> not, not that way. Okay. Now, before we go, go in and talk about some more details here, I want to point out a really important thing. We've been talking about making qubits. If you read newspaper and reporting on quantum computing, there's all these people making a lot of qubits right now. It's a very exciting time. But I want to educate you about something else that's really important. And it's not just the number of qubits you have. It's their quality. And, you know, number of, of qubits or, you know, number of bits, of course, is what we're used to when we do electronics. We know that the bigger memory size is better. But you have to realize that in quantum computing, these quantum bits are very fragile and they tend to make errors. And you absolutely have to talk about qubit quality. It's kind of like saying you're going to go to the moon and you have to build this big Saturn V rocket to launch to the moon, which is the quantity part. But you know, if you don't aim the rocket, very well, it is going to crash and explode and burn up all the astronauts. So we have to aim our qubits and control them really well to get this to work. And to kind of describe how important that is, I'm going to talk just some simple data here for uh, how quality matters for quantum chemistry experiments. And quantum chemistry is a natural application of, of, of uh, of quantum computers because right now people use supercomputers to simulate, to calculate how the chemical bonds work and what the energies are. And you know, 30% of supercomputer time is used to do quantum chemistry. It's very important. But because the complexity scales exponentially with the complexity of the molecule, you can't do, it's very hard to do in, in an in, accurate way uh, a big molecule. So it's a very natural application for a quantum computer because you can just map the quantum mechanics of chemistry to the qubit physics and then do the calculation. Now what physicists do is do simple experiments to see if all these ideas are working right. And the experiment I'm going to describe here is what is the binding energy of a hydrogen molecule, which is actually the simplest problem you learn in physics and chemistry on quantum chemistry. It's not a hard, hard problem. And this can be solved exactly analytically. And you see here in the black line this energy uh, in these uh, chemical units, Hartree, versus how far the two uh, atoms are apart in the molecule. And you see as they get together, they bind, the energy goes down. And in fact, what you need to do typically in quantum chemistry is know the difference between this energy where it's lowest to the energy when they're far apart, that tells you the binding energy, and then you know all the, the chemistry you need to know to figure out how, how that molecule is going to work. So this is a very natural thing to do on a quantum computer. It's not too hard. And I'm going to show the, these results from 2015 by our group, where the quality of our uh, qubits, the two-qubit interaction, which is the key interaction to get this thing to work right, 
was actually pretty good. It was about 0.5% error. And by doing that, we have the blue lines. And in fact, it gets this binding energy between here and here to what is known as chemi chemical accuracy, which is accurate enough for the chemists to use in their ordinary room temperature calculation. It works really well. Um, more recently, uh, just, just to show how important this is, a more recent experiment by another group repeated the cal calculation in 2017, but because they had a scaled up version there, their qubits didn't operate so well. It was about a 5% error instead of 0.5% error, and that's given in the red dots. And in fact, you see that the calculation of the energies they get is not so good. Okay, and in fact, it's about 10 or 20 times worse accuracy than what we did in 2015 because the, uh, the quality of the qubit operations are not as good. And in fact, you need this kind of uh, operation quality in order to do something that's going to be potentially useful for, uh, for people. So again, you need low errors for accurate prediction. Okay. So I'm going to go on and talk now about the, the experiment we're working towards this year and the beginning of this, the next year. And it just really goes back. It's an experiment that's going to force us to build a, a quantity of qubits and also a quality of qubits at the same time. And this is really hard to do. And what we're going to do is do an experiment where we're going to run 49 qubits with enough depth and enough complexity and get some result so that if we wanted to know if that result worked properly, we're going to have to do a simulation, the quantum simulation of the system with a classical supercomputer, the biggest computer on the planet. Okay, so, uh, and this is a way we, we hope to show that a quantum computer can in fact be very powerful. It's not going to do anything useful, but we would like to show that you have this huge parallelism and that you can do something very powerful. Okay, so I kind of like to think of it as this little physics experiment here, something we build in a small lab versus the huge infrastructure of these giant computer data centers. And you know, can we kind of compete on this one uh, problem in that way? So this is the, the, the algorithm and it's actually quite simple, okay? This is a quantum circuit uh, diagram. It's kind of like a schematic of classical logic. This is time and this are, these are each qubits here. And these boxes will represent single qubit operations that are a knot or a square root of knot operation. And they're known operation, but randomly chosen from knots and square roots of knots and some other generalization of those things. Okay, so these are known and, but randomly chosen. And then these are some two qubit uh, interactions, which are very similar to an exclusive or operations of two regular bits. It's the quantum analogy of that. So you basically take your qubits, they start in the zero state, you do these, ran these known but uh, randomly chosen square root of odd and odd operations, you have them interact together, and then at the end you measure what you're going to get out of it. Okay. Again, this is not a useful algorithm, but I'll show you why it's, it can show power. There's no structure to this problem. So when you try to like understand or guess what's going to be out here, what you're going to guess is that you're going to get a random state here. You're going to get 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, all the possible combinations, 2 to the n combinations of all the possible combinations of 0 and 1. And, you, and, and classically, you're going to say, I'm going to get those with equal probability because this is scrambling up the state so much. What happens is quantum mechanically that doesn't happen and you're going to take advantage of that to you to check the calculation. And the analogy I like to use to this circuit here, very physical, very good analogy, is this here. I have a 300 milliwatt laser, but to make it safe and to do the demonstration, I put a piece of frosted glass at the top here, which takes the light and then scatters it uh, out in, in, in a big cone here. 
Now, classically, if you take light and scatter it out, you're going to get a big light distribution here. But because this is a coherent light source, when you do that, I hope people can see that, you're going to get this green light spectrum, green light diffused here. But if you look at it, there are certain directions where the light is bright and certain directions where it's dark. Okay? And this is known as speckle for coherent. And what's happening in some direction, the light from the laser is hitting different places here and constructively adding, making it brighter. And in some directions, it's destructively adding and making it dimmer. Okay? And what happens is, is when we run the qubits here, we get qubit speckle, where some states are more likely to uh, uh, be measured than other states. Some have very low probability, some has high probability, in the same way that light here in some directions it's very bright, in some directions it's very dim. And what we're going to do in the quantum algorithm is just measure what states we get out to here and see, first of all, if there are low and high probabilities, and then second of all, are the high probability states, the ones we're most likely to measure, are they going to be the predicted high value states? And of course, to predict that, you have to run a supercomputer to check that. So that's the, that's the supremacy algorithm. And that way, we can check you know, uh, a, a quant whether a quantum computer works at 49 qubits, 50 qubits, to the 50 states. Okay. Now, we've already test it out whether this algorithm works on the nine qubit device that I, I showed you. Okay, and this is some data from that. Uh, I know it's maybe a little bit too technical, but this is basically in this direction a measurement of cl how close were we to measure the speckle pattern that we predicted. Okay, so if there's a perfect prediction of that speckle pattern, it's one. If it's a random guess, it's going to be zero. And for, from, for three qubits all the way up to nine qubits, we see this normalized cross entropy, which is this measure, is 70, 80, 90 percent, very high prediction. And then, of course, what we see is we have more qubits, or we do more operations, uh, that uh, match goes down and down, again, because of the, the qubit errors I was telling you about. The qubits don't operate perfectly. And you have to make sure that the algorithm is short enough that it's uh, working properly. And in fact, the, the error per cycle is about 0.3%, which is kind of at the world record, world uh, performance for such a complex system. It's actually hard to do that. So we see, this, we see basically the speckle pattern, and everything's fine. If you were just to scale this up to 45 or maybe 49 qubits, uh, and if nothing else went wrong, we would expect values like this. And this is big enough different than zero that we actually think uh, we can show this. So this quantum supremacy, this checking of the speckle pattern, actually looks you know, kind of reasonable to try. We're optimistic that we should be able to do it. We still have to work hard and get everything to work. But uh, it, it looks quite possible to do this. I now, just kind of closing up, I want to give some another example of how we're using the quantum computer. Again, this is a little bit of a toy problem, but what I want to show here is we can get very complex data and measure that very, very accurately with our quantum computer. So the conceptual problem that we're thinking about here is a two-dimensional sheet of atoms. Think of it as graphene which is a, just a two-dimensional sheet of, of essentially diamond or carbon. And what we want to know is the quantum energy levels versus what happens when we put on a magnetic field here. Okay, and the quantum energy levels you can kind of think as the oscillation frequency or tones of the system. And uh, uh, well, we want to do that with a magnetic field. And if you take for nine lattice site here, you can actually uh, compute what those energy levels are going to look like versus a magnetic field, where here, this one of this normalized magnetic field corresponds to 10,000 Tesla, uh, which puts one quantum flux quantum in, in one of these loops. The interesting thing about this is 10,000 Tesla 
is not something you can do in the lab. Okay, so this is something you can only calculate. So this would be, a, this is a very good uh, quantum simulation problem because here's something that you might be able to test out in the lab, uh, it, you know, with your quantum computer because you can't do in the lab. The lab accessibility is down here. Now when you look at the, all these tones in the atom eigenstates, eigenfrequencies of this, you see this very complex behavior. So you see, see there's regions here where the, the frequencies, this is versus magnetic field. So each of these has nine frequencies versus field. And you see there's regions where the frequencies don't want to be. And this kind of structure here is called a Hofstadter butterfly. And there's kind of a fractal behavior to this which is giving you all these complicated waveforms and these gaps here and very complex behavior. Now this is actually a problem we can simulate with our quantum computer doing a quantum materials uh, problem. And uh, you know, when we tune it up and get this all to work, the question is, well, are we really going to be able to see all this kind of structure in the problem? And what I want to show you is this is the data with our quantum computer where the dots are the data and the line is the expected theory. And you see you get super good agreement between the theory lines and where the L's dots. And you see when there's all this structure of the oscillating go, going back and forth, it really picks up all this detailed structure here. And in fact, the difference between the experiment and theory is color coded. It's typically around five megahertz or so. That's on energies of 100, 200, 300 megahertz. So there's only a few percent error here. So the point I want to make here is, OK, it's still of a toy problem. But we can control our qubits and calibrate them accurately enough now that we can get physically meaningful information that's accurate enough for, some, for us to get some insight about what's going on on our quantum computer. So we're very optimistic that we can use this for, for real problems once we learn how to make them better and scale it up more. It really looks like you can control and calibrate them well enough. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about quantum chemistry and quantum materials because it's such an important application. I think it might drive the use of a quantum computer. Again, you're mapping a quantum problem of chemistry to the, the quantum computer, which is a natural mapping. You expect this to work. Um, it's a little bit technical, but I want to kind of go through the history. It's an interesting history. The basic idea to propose using a quantum computer to solve chemistry was first proposed by Feynman in the, the beginning 80s, the mid 80s, okay? And uh, that was very nice and motivated people to think about it. But it wasn't until about 20 years till people started thinking about how actually you would put together the algorithm and do that. And in 2005, there was basic concepts on how you do it. And the idea there, what I mean by this order poly n, is that it wouldn't scale exponentially hard. It wouldn't take an exponential number of operations to do it. So that you are gaining by using a quantum computer over a classical computer. But of course, you don't have an explicit algorithm. And various people worked on it. And finally, in 2014, 13, that's only four years ago, people came up with an algorithm you could write down and you would kind of know how complicated that algorithm would be. Okay, so for the computer scientists in the room, it means if n is the problem size, then it scales as n to the 11th power. Okay, and those computer scientists in the room knows, knows that that means that it won't work. Okay, it scales too hard. And you can kind of see that. You're probably going to need about 50 or 100 for n to, to do an interesting thing. And n to the 11 is maybe 10 to the 21. And giving a rough scaling of that, that's the lifetime of the universe to do the calculation. No good. But people kept working on it. And various tricks and ideas have been coming along over time in the last few years. And finally, this, this spring, we have this exact solution that's only n to the 2.7, an approximate solution that's order n to the n, order n, with, again, the computer scientists and say, OK, that's something you can get to work. And in that case, you can probably run this in under a second or so, given how it works. 
So this is really exciting because we think we could be able to do it. I'm almost done. And uh, either with uh, the exact solution, maybe a million qubit system, which is going to take some time, but we are moving towards that, or maybe with this approximate solution with something like 100 physical qubits, which we're definitely working on. So we have to see. So it's very exciting at this point. Useful kind of now possible. It's, you know, we're having an algorithm, we're building systems. It's a very exciting time. We'll have to see what happens. So that I want to conclude. Here's the team working on it. Again, I want to emphasize we're now at a point where we're building these complex systems. The number of qubits are scaling up. It's very important also, as you look at what's going on, to know the quality of the qubits, especially the two qubit interactions. If, if people can crack that problem and get that to work well, then that's going to be you know, a big advance and we're going to be able to do these things. So pay attention to that as you hear what's going on in, in our field. Okay, thank you very much. John Martinez, ladies and gentlemen.